Well, I see we've got some of our stalwarts back. I knew that we were going to lose some. Um, so what that says to me is that we can do maybe even more discussion than usual, like we did uh, when we closed out the last, last session. I want to ask you, though, before we get too far down the road, um, next week we have a really fun one, I hope. I really looking forward to myself. Wayne is going to do the same presentation that he does on cruise ships. And it's, it's about the connection between geography and religion. And so he's, he's going to make all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of observations that I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what he comes up That's with. Next Sunday? Next Sunday. Okay. The original plan was that this cluster that we're in right now would be three sessions. And I probably need 300 sessions to do, it, <laughs> to do it justice because there's so much meat, you know, to get in here, which is why I'm, I'm thinking you guys might have some fun tackling some of the pieces today. Um, but I want to find out how many of you uh, want to try and have a session in two weeks because it'll be the 28th and that's the beginning of, of the, the holiday weekend. Yeah. And so many people are gone. You know, we did it last year and we had a success, but we did it with a small group sort of like this and we just had free range. Mm -hmm. You know, we just, we just said, where, where shall we take this based on where we started? And I'm, I'm comfortable with that. That was fun. That works for us because we're not going anywhere that weekend. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we can come. You guys going to be around? Oh, we got family in town from Guam. <laughs> okay. So, so maybe it's worth it to, to take a stab at it, um, even if I don't present as much as I normally would. So what I think I'll do with, with this small group, then, is go ahead and try and set the foundation for what we'll do in the fall. And so what we're talking about in what I've labeled a century of conflict is the beginnings of this great split in American Christianity between what comes to be called liberals, and I hate that because it's not the way I tend to think of liberals, certainly not the way I would identify in some of the things that they said. But liberals is a, is a flip side or another word or another name for modernists, depending on who you're reading, what, what academic source, most of the time they're called liberals. And if you hear it from the other side, which are most of the time called fundamentalists, but sometimes called <clears throat> excuse me, evangelicals, they kind of have a sneer when they say liberals. You know, it's kind of like the, the edge of their mouth curls a little bit. And you can start to see why when you, when you see some of the things that um, famous preachers in America came up with and, and offered to the church-going public that said, this is why we go to church, this is what scripture is about, this is what we need to be um, paying attention to. Not what I grew up with in many instances. But at, at its core, there are totally different ways of approaching the thinking, and that's what I want you to see in terms of the conflict. On the, the, the side that would be called fundamentalists, they would be saying, what we've heard, what we've read, what we understand from Scripture is true now and forever, and it's unchanging. Don't bother me with other aspects of, of your study because what you're giving me is from your head. It's not from Scripture. Keep going. Where does Scripture come from? Yeah, it's not from God. So one of the defenses that was raised by um, one of the early believers in kind of both sides at once and trying to harmonize this says, 
You know, I can see the point of what these academics and what these scientists are saying. They've got a point. But I'm also a member of this fundamentalist sect, and that's from God. So probably what's happened is God has sent us a test. He's given us another way of looking at things that's not his way. And he wants to put us to the test so that we will strengthen ourselves and strengthen our faith in what we know to be true. Maybe we should then not come next Sunday and have everybody here. Well, we'll we, we've got a long time to spend with this. And we're going to have, I, I hate to say it because it sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm not being faithful or, or religious about this, but this is fun. This is good stuff. This is, this is one of the things, if you're, if you're consequential, I think, about your faith, you have to ask questions. Now, where I was talking with Pastor Jay a half an hour ago, and I said, I was trying to see if I could come up with where did this all start? Where did, where did the, what was, what was the gun that, that, that started people on this race? And it's easy to say it started with Darwin, but in America it took a while because Darwin has published, Origin of Species is published in 1859. Now think back to your American history, what's about to happen in 1859? Civil War. Yeah. Civil War, yeah. So we have other fish in the griddle, you know, as it were, at the time. But after the Civil War is done, you have North and South that doesn't go away in terms of, of the conflicts in the church. And, and the South becomes um, embedded in the old style Calvinism and don't bother me with anything else. And the old style Calvinism is not real far from Lutheranism because it's grounded in the Reformation. But it has some tweaks to it that are not necessarily what we really want to want to say is our way of thinking right now today. But the flip side of that and why I kind of twisted John's arm to make sure that he could come in and, and give us a little added insight as we go down here is the flip side is this is also the time when modern academia starts realizing, you know what? There, there is a point to the scientific method, and there is a point to academic study, and we can apply it, guess what, to scripture itself. We can learn about the Bible by using some of the same techniques that we use as we study natural phenomena all around us, or as we study how the mind works, or as maybe even more scary, how language works. So all of these things converge at once. So there comes a point, and I needed to look it up, and I'll get it for you in the fall, of when the actual gun is fired. And I, I, I told Pastor Jay, I think probably the best way to put a mark on it is when, I love this title, the, the guy who is the head of Princeton Theological Seminary, they call the principal. <laughs> my, my other son's a principal. Anne was a principal. I studied to be a principal, never got to be one. But if you're the principal in, in, in a seminary, or at least in, in these times, you are kind of the, the head educator. You are kind of the leader, as it were, of um, the, the thinking of the institution as well if you will. So what, what the, the head of Princeton Theological Seminary, not to be confused with Princeton University, which is actually separate, he said Darwinism is atheism. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel that if you're a scholar, you know, if you're, if you're someone who says, I can show you evidence that you're not going to be able to dispute. I can, I can show you, and you know what? 
You can try this yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. But he said, nah, -uh. that's not okay. Because what we have is given to us by God. So how do you reconcile those? Well, it's kind of interesting to do, but it, it didn't stop there. This is also the time, and I want to go through this piece by piece a little bit, both now and in the fall, when sociology is invented, when the history of religion is invented, the idea of comparative religions comes, comes to mind, and people are looking at ancient religions. When I was at St. Olaf, one of the things that I heard that rocked my tree pretty hard was the idea that Christianity did not invent, in the sense of being the first religion ever to talk about it, the idea of resurrection. Not only resurrection, but resurrection in three days. So where would Christianity have gotten that? Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism was an ancient religion in the, in the ancient Near East. And when the Christians were deported to Babylon, they would have come into contact with this. So how do you reconcile that? Well, the way that I came up with it, a little novel, but I think it's okay, is I, I take my cue from Luther, who liked his beard. He married a gal that kept him financially stable by running a brewery. It's pretty cool. <laughs> she was the brewer, and they made money, and he was able to have big dinners every night, and you all came, and Luther would just spill his guts. You know, there's a neat book called Luther's Table Talks, where he talks about everything under the sun. Some things you wouldn't really expect your pastor to be talking about. <laughs> You know, I, I like what uh, R.C. Sproul, the famous guy that's no longer with us, that leads the, the Reformed Church teaching. He says, I don't think Luther had an, un an unuttered fault in his thought, in his mind. I think he always blurted it out, you know. So Luther liked to go to the taverns, and since they didn't have sports bars back in those days, what they did is they apparently joined arms and they had rousing songs. And some of them were just great. And you went for the camaraderie and you liked to sing along with each other. And Luther said, why should the devil get all the good tunes? <laughs> <laughs> so he took a lot of those tunes and he made them into hymns. <laughs> and I think that what God in his wisdom has done in part, at least in this case, is he's taken some ideas that seem to work with humankind and said, you know what, I'm going to use that. That will work. Mm -hmm. Now, you could say it was part of the original plan and some of these other people just hit on pieces of it. Take your choice as to how you want to go there. But I like to think that God in his infinite wisdom was smart enough to know Jake might understand this. <laughs> if I try it this way, rather than some dry explanation starting from scratch. It's just a thought. Do with that what you will. Okay, let's start with Super. I was glad when they said, let's go into the house of the Lord. Lord, it's good to be here. It's good to be alive. It's good to be with mothers where we can. It's good to honor our, our wives, our families. It's good to honor you. We come to you for understanding today and we ask that you send your spirit to be with us as we kick around thoughts that have not always sat well with each other. And as we look at your church, we ask that you give us understanding and tolerance and acceptance and a willingness to try and come closer to you by working together with each other. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. See if I can bring this back up.
Hey, Jake, while you're doing that, did, did, did you did you you said that all those areas of, of study, sociology, and, and th that all came out what, in the later 19th century? Yeah, we're, we're oh, okay. talking the turn of the 20th century, oh, turn of the late 19th. 19th, late 1800s. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. These are now becoming academic disciplines okay. that people can study and take degrees in, and 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 can can do some uh, some development that um, gets them. Here we go. Thank you. What we talked about last week, some we talked about one area of conflict between was anti-Catholicism, and what I just wanted to add to that before going on to another area is that. Americans tend to think of parochial schools as, as a kind of a negative thing if they're not of the Catholic faith. And they kind of think if you're of a, of a strong, like I was in the teachers union, um, a strong advocate of public education, you say they're siphoning off money that we desperately need, you know, over here in public education, and even more important, they're siphoning off contributing parents and parents that are interested enough in their education to speak out and to come and be engaged and involved and so forth. But parochial schools at, at the beginning were essentially a defensive measure. They were essentially a means whereby Catholics could combat this prejudice and this discrimination that they were finding, and uphold to some extent their tradition. Um, I was telling Pastor Jay about the family story. Uh, we have an interfaith marriage in our family. My first <clears throat> son married a Catholic, and there's some interesting repartee that goes along, I'll just say, but you can guess what faith their kids are raised in. We have one set of grandkids that are Catholic and one set of grandkids that are coming here. It's not interfaith. Yeah. We're, we're Christian. That's not interfaith. That's right. But the first time when my grandson went to something called reconciliation, he was having his first reconciliation. Uh, ooh, what's this? It's a preparation for confession. Oh. You know, he's getting old enough. He's got to learn how to meet with the priest, you know, learn how to do all this, learn how to bear his soul, and learn how to confess, you know, some of the things that, oh my. <laughs> we have some of that, we just don't use it very much. If you look in the hymnal, you'll find yeah. lots of stuff that'll surprise you about ancient Lutheran faith and, and, and how we have kept some of those rights, we just don't practice so much. But and so we do have confession, you know, but we do it publicly, you know, as a part of our liturgy, week after week. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's right. Okay. So I just wanted to make that point. We may come back to it. What's fascinating is that both the liberals and the fundamentalists, both the moderns and the fundamentalists, pretty much drop all pretense about being believers in the, the brotherhood of man at the turn of the century. They got wrapped up in um, the American idea that says, we have it right, we have a mission to show the world how this thing works, and it's both, um, it's both non-religious and religious at the same time. As, as a religious um, depiction, it's we have a duty to Christianize those savages, those individuals who have not yet seen the light, as it were. And what if they're Catholic? Well, if they're Catholic already, they're already Christian, to your point, but Catholicism at the time, in this case at the turn of the century, was tied with the old world. And remember, we we're founded as a country by people who were escaping Catholicism. You know, 
We go back to the Reformation, Henry VIII, who wanted to have his own church so that he could get divorced, so he could have a kid. And then the, the Puritans, who were part of the Anglic Anglican uh, uh, church, said, there's, there's too much Catholicism left in that. We don't want any of it. We want to purify the church of all those old last vestiges. And we can't do it in England, so we'll go to America and start from scratch. So we were born with the idea in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the, the Puritans that went to, to Plymouth Rock. We were born with kind of a burr in our saddle when it came to Catholics, just, just to start with. And now you would like to think we've grown out of this because there are Catholic colonies. You know, there are, there's Catholicism working as well. And we're, we, we like to think we're past all these riots that we were thinking by the, by the turn of the century. Nope. We decided that one of the arguments for going to war with Spain was to liberate the Philippines from this old negative kind of dying out last vestiges of Catholic Spain. Catholic Spain was, you know, the old world. They weren't with it. They were monarchist. Everything about them was kind of anti-Americanism. And President McKinley said, you know what? He said, when I saw that we were going to land with, with the Philippines in our, um, in our grasp, he said, I didn't know what we were going to do with them. All right. And so when we won the Spanish-American War, which we started, even though people said Spain must have blown up our ship in Havana Bay, the name. Remember the name was the cry. We had stories that were printed in the newspapers at the time of Spanish interrupting American commerce and twisting American women on steamers and so forth. You know, and the idea that this swarthy, black, this swarthy dark skinned Spanish guy was was kind of uh, having taking liberties in, in inspecting women and stuff. William Randolph Hearst, Joseph Pulitzer were engaged in a conscription war. They were trying to outdo each other to sell newspapers. And they discovered that what was yellow journalism, it was called, they, they outdid each other with outrageous stories. Week after week, day after day, if they found something that would sell newspapers, they were there. And you like to think with the Pulitzer Prize and so forth and so on for excellence in German in journalism, that that's what they were all about. No, it, it was it was subscription. Now, this picture is a little um, unsettling. What does it remind you of? Think forward in our time. Hitler executing people. Someone said, you know, think, think about, uh, can you think of a massacre that we were involved in in, in the past 50 years? Vietnam. Or thereabouts? Vietnam. Yeah. I'm thinking about Vietnam. This is what we did to the Filipinos that were on our side after the war. After the war, we said, okay, we're going to run you now. We're going to rule you now. But, you know, they said, wait a minute, you told us we were going to be independent. We made a deal with the Catholic Church, even though we were bagging on them. We said, you know what, we are going to liberate the Philippines, but we won't take your property. So they invited the bishop of... Um, I think East Coast or Boston to, to write in some of the fundamentalist papers of the time. And he did a long thing that said, you know, it's okay to have this war. Guess what we did right after the war was over? Took their property. 
So we did not cover ourselves with glory. We had an ally by the name of Emilio Aguinaldo. Aguinaldo was a guy whose partisans, local guys, helped the U.S. to defeat the Spanish. He was the natural leader that was to, that was to succeed and to, to follow up. He became a rebel afterwards when he found out we had no intention of keeping our promises. And this is what we did. And it became, it became a real black eye and, and people started exposing it within about five years. And Mark Twain and several others of, of, of prominence uh, started writing about it and said, this is, this is awful, it's unbecoming of America. And this just goes to show you that even though you have ideas on one side and ideas on the other side, doesn't mean that either one is Simon Pure or that they've got it all together. You know, they can completely get caught up in Americanism and patriotism, call it what you like. This is manifest destiny 50 years later. This is the idea of, of what is to come. So this was a war of aggression on our part, but it made America an undisputed power in the world, which is what we wanted. Teddy Roosevelt and the others said, we have to flex American muscle. We have a brand new Navy. They called it the Great White Fleet. And we said that we are the equal of England, Germany, and France, who were also colonizing at the turn of the century. We wanted to play with the big boys. We did for a little while. So we wound up with uh, places in the Pacific, in the Pacific that all of a sudden, we were administering. Okay, change of scenes. Go ahead, Terry. Wasn't a, wasn't a lot of that for to establish coaling stations for well, for the if you have why, the why would we really care about yeah. this little this little island out in the middle? There's of a great state? story about that. I don't want to divert you, but uh, it, it's Teddy Roosevelt who said to Congress. I have this brand new navy. I want to I want to run it around the world and and show off. What, what a great Navy we have. Congress said, cost too much. So he checked with the Secretary of the Navy and he said, how much coal have you got? Well, you, you'll never get it back with what we've got. Have you got enough coal to take you halfway? <laughs> he said, we got enough coal to get there, we just don't have enough. So he said, go. And then he wrote Congress a note and says, your Navy's over here. If you want them back, you've got to buy the coal. <laughs> if, you, if you want to make that, you know, he was, he was a great believer in flexing American muscle. When it came to the Panama Canal, he actually said for attribution, for quoting, I took it. I took the Panama Canal. When they couldn't negotiate a deal, he said, ah, we'll just take it. So, now, I'm going to run through this kind of quick because we've talked about it from time to time and you know that that's the massive, the massive issue of the late 19th century is abolition of slavery and the Civil War. But what was not really well understood is it broke churches apart too. So first along the line is going to be, of all things, the Presbyterians and it continued into the 20th century, into what came to be known as Jim Crow. What's Jim Crow? Lawmaker of some Anyone? Sort. Jim Crow is the terminology, it's a shorthand for the laws that were passed in the South to put discrimination in place against blacks. These were the restrictive laws that said, if you're black, you can't do this. You have to have separate drinking fountains and so forth. They were still there when I was down south in 1965. I remember going to a rock concert and I was just stunned to see drinking fountains over here for white folks and then one little bitty one, you know, 100 yards away, colored, with a sign right above it. That's 1965. In Montgomery, Alabama, where that, uh, where that, concert was that we went to see in at the state capitol in Montgomery they flew the confederate flag and the state flag 
And in the backyard, on about a, uh, maybe 100 feet, maybe, pole in the backyard. You can see the American flag flying in the backyard. But as you stood on the portico and looked over that, that, um, that American flag, you might very well be standing on a gold star embedded in the floor, very much like the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And you know what that gold star com commemorated? This is where Jefferson Davis took the oath of office as president of the Confederacy. Really? That was 1965. 1965? Really? Yeah. And I suspect it's still there. It is. Our sons were there this week. Oh. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, they, they sent a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, texted a picture of it. I, they're not gonna... It's a bronze, yeah, it's a bronze, just as you describe it. I was getting put yeah. up here. So, we'd already seen conflict in Calvinism and Presbyterianism and the Reformed Church, if you will, over this idea of Ar Arminianism. Do you remember what that was? Arminianism is short for an idea proposed by Jacob Arminius, which goes against the heart of Calvinism and Lutheranism. Arminianism is the idea that we have enough free will that we can say, okay, God, I accept you. That's very much a part, oddly enough, of fundamentalism today. Fundamentalism today, evangelicalism today is the word that they would use today, would say, and they have it in hymns. It's a, it's a big article of faith. I can tell you about the time, I can tell you about the place where I was that's the one that's the one and when you are born again you say I give up the old light said you can't do that and by the way as a footnote again Chris is, is recording this so it will be on the YouTube uh, channel for all of, all that we have here, this presentation is going to be available that you can that you can come back to again and again if you want to see it. So we'd already seen this played out some. The old lights say, no, 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 you are born totally depraved, you can't fix yourself, you can't do this on your own. And I love what Luther said about it. He got it right, but it's still something that, that gravels me a little bit. I still Go against the bit a little bit. It says, remember, article third, uh, the third article of the, the Apostles' Creed, Luther's Exploit? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. But what happens? How do we get there? What works on us to get us there? Who works on there? Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit calls me by the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, and then sanctifies and keeps me. Now, where the Methodists are going to go down a different path than we do a little bit, they'll say, you're not sanctified once, you're sanctified twice if you're all the way good, if you're all the way committed. The Holy Spirit can keep on working you, and ultimately you can be made perfect. You can get to the point where you don't need to sin anymore because you've given up and you've surrendered and you're enough in sin. We have a hard time with that. We say, no, look, you're lost in sin. You need to confess all the time. You know, Luther calls it picking up on Paul, the old Adam, dying in the morning, dying every day, dying to faith, putting on, not the old Adam again, <laughs> the new Adam. Putting on the whole armor of God. You're going out in the battle. You're going out against the forces that are working on you. So this is not new that there's conflict in the basic ideas about the faith. But what's new now is we got splintering off. We got everybody and their brothers starting a church. Everybody and their brothers got a different idea that says, you know, I think this is what we need to emphasize. So this is the beginning of denominationalism. 
and you get different tweaks in this. And one of the things that I kind of want to finish up when we when we finally wind up this series is just a whirlwind catalog of the ones that we're most familiar with, and, and see if we can lay out, you know, some of the similarities and some of the differences. But it begins here. In the South, the South says, I don't want to hear about what you're doing up there. I don't want to hear it. We've got it. We're set. We have a system. We don't want to mess with it. And so anyone particularly, because it's again, it's tied with slavery. So we're about to see a tidal shift in the way that the South regards slavery in the context of the church. And it isn't just in the context of the church, it's in, it's in Congress. The fellow who's mostly gonna be identified politically with this um, point of view, John C. Calhoun, Senator of South Carolina. He's gonna to to be the one that gives it its basic articulation. Slavery is no longer just economically nece necessary. It isn't just something that is a, an economic issue. It's not even a regional issue in terms of who gets to decide how we live. Slavery is, fill in the blank with one word, it's good. It's gospel. It's in scripture. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's part of God's plan. Don't mess with it. It got so bad in Congress that one northerner, I can't remember the name, I almost had it there for a second, but I lost it, was, was sitting in his chair preparing a, a response or whatever, you know, in the debate, and a fellow from the South took his cane and beat him about the head and shoulders, and he almost died. It was a vicious, brutal, savage assault. This was in Congress. He never, he never served a day in jail. Never had any, never had any repercussions of it. North and South are starting to divide on this. Young people, beginning even all the way back to Jefferson's time, this goes back before this, saying. Don't go up to Yale, don't go up to Harvard, and of all things, don't go to Princeton. Yale is bad. Harvard was older, might even be worse, but Princeton, they thought, and Union Theological Seminary, where they tried to put the, the two kind of disparate factions back together and create a, a, a seminary that, that could recognize both. Those are all radical ideas. You come back down south of those ideas, you'll be untethered from your, from your roots. This is not a good thing. Jefferson said, we have to have our own university. We have to be able to teach it the way we want. And people regard the University of Virginia that he set up as one of the, the great institutions you know, of free thought in America. All right, here we go. Even before the middle of the century, Presbyterians have shifted. They now have North and South. There's other groups, but to keep it simple, we'll just say there's a Northern branch and there's a Southern branch. Baptists break apart. This is again before 1850 and the last effort to try and make the compromise before the Civil War. So 15 years before Civil War broke, there was one last big effort in 1850. By the way, what state in the Union caused the most problems from the standpoint of precipitating the Civil War in terms of this controversy? It would be easy to say South Carolina because they fired the first shot at Fort Sumter. It would be easy to pick any of them in the Deep South. That would, that would be an easy shot. It would be easy to say Missouri, because that's where the compromise was first struck. It would be easier to say Kansas, because people were fighting there. And it, was, it had religious overtones, because we talked about uh, Harry Ward Beecher that sent Beecher's Bibles. What were Beecher's Bibles? 
Rifles. Rifles. Yeah. Marked in a box that Charles said Bibles. Bible. Uh, sent them to the people in Kansas. The state that I'm looking for? California. Ah, I guessed right. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> uh, right so why? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I just figured we're always it's a, it's in a, the a, middle of something. It's a, it's a good pick. Think about the time. 1850. What's hap what has just begun? The gold rush. Gold rush. Gold rush. The gold rush. And what happens with the gold rush? People Everybody from knows. everywhere come in. Yeah. Okay. California is the only state in the U.S. history that didn't go through the territorial phase. We went straight to statehood. Oh. You know, we had a constitution before it was permitted. You know, as a territory, we, we grew so fast. There were so many people coming in. And what's fascinating, the history is, the first draft of our con constitution for California permitted slavery. It included the slavery cause. If you go up to one of my favorite areas that, uh, that Chris and I take pictures at just outside of Lone Pine called the Alabama Hills, you know, it's a really striking set of geographical formations that there are gazillions of movies and, and commercials have been shot up there. It's named for the Alabama Hills because there were Confederate sympathizers that were prospecting there and they, they kind of laid claim to it. It was named after a, a successful Confederate privateer. What's a privateer? Soldier Variety. It's a pirate ship. Oh. It's a raider. It doesn't have official status, but it gets to to go out under the under the guise of being Francis, you know, Francis yeah. Drake. Yeah. And you get to keep whatever you can take, whatever you can count. Well, they did actually get a permit from somebody, and then that somebody like the monarch or something would get a cut. So not official naval ships, but right. operating right. sort of freelance, but yeah. under the auspices of now, somebody. Don't get me wrong, we did that too to the British. Yeah, of course. You know, it's a it's an old old tradition, but. This particular one was probably the most famous one. It was called the Alabama, and these guys looked up to those those guys. These rough and tumble Californians said that would be great. But then when they finally got around to settling and, and everybody voted, they went 180 degrees and they outlawed slavery. So here you have this big new territory coming in and it doesn't fit any of the earlier compromises. So you have a state coming in so slavery was important for Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, all the big names. Lutherans aren't going to have a big issue about it yet. They're not. They're not fighting about that yet. And there's a panel right now that's pick, that's uh, bringing out that fact yeah. to reparations for black people in California, yeah. and they're using that as a California. Well, it's there's some truth to it, but California is not a good state for slavery because the climate doesn't work southern part you could probably have some plantations but in order for slavery to work at this time you you needed to be able to have big land and you have to have the right climate for cotton you wouldn't grow cotton in sacramento you, you, wouldn't, know they you wouldn't do that in san francisco <laughs> but you might be able to do it in san bernardino you might you know i, I haven't check to make sure that the season is just right enough but you'd have to have more water probably than we have but people figured that out before too long and the real the real reason we don't have slavery here is because it wasn't economically feasible if it had been ex economically feasible they probably would have found some way to try it because there were no regulations against it in the territory it was not it was not part of the compromise of 1850. Texas, on the other hand, was a big issue. Texas would have been great. And the South said, you know what, we're going to take Texas and we'll carve it up into five states and we'll make them all slave trades. Slave states. Say that five times now. Let me make sure I understand this. I, so California really didn't have much in the way of slavery? No. But yet California is trying to do you could bring slaves for slavery. You could bring that slaves to California. Sense. Well, because we didn't change the laws about uh, if, if slaves came, in, came into California, we we honored the system of returning them back to their owners. So we we were not against slavery, kind of, and, and uh, even though we didn't have it, 
we looked the other way and we didn't. Uh, so why do we want to do I, reparations then? It's, uh, that's what bothers me. I don't get it. You could have slaves in the slaves. Well, no, what, what bothers me about it, we're going to give money to people that live today whose ancestors 400 years ago were slaves. I don't get the logic of that. Well, the panel says that uh, they suffered, uh, their forefathers suffered, so they should be well, compensated. But they don't even know these people, and we're going to give them money. Okay. Well, that's not definite yet. And that's Let's, sort of no, but that's what, no, I'm trying to, but that's what they're trying to do. Hold that, hold that thought, Earl, till, till we get Sorry, to, till we get to 20th know. century, because that's <laughs> the sort of thing that we'll, we'll want to get to. All right. Now, what I want to do today is I want to use uh, Dwight Moody, who I've talked about, as kind of the entering wedge for all of this that we're about to get into. So Dwight Moody is the next revival speaker. He's not only known for that, but this is how he breaks in. Dwight Moody comes onto the scene, and he's just an extraordinary story. If any of you ever wonder in the faith about one person making a difference in the world, you don't have to go any further than Dwight Moody or his Sunday school teacher to see that, yes, one person can change history. Dwight Moody's Sunday school teacher caught him in a situation where Dwight had left the family home. He was not going to go anywhere. He was a single parent home. His father had been killed in the Civil War, if I remember right. Or maybe he was the one that just abandoned the home. Whatever it was, he had a bunch of brothers and it was a dead end scenario. He said, I want to go to, to, to the big city and make money. And he was good. He was a great salesman. So he went to work at his uncle's shoe store and his uncle said, I don't want him hanging around all the time with time on his hands and nothing to do. He's got to go to church. If he's going to come and live with me and be in my territory, he's going to have to go to Sunday school. And his Sunday school teacher took a shine to him and said, I want to convert this kid. I want to save him for Christ. Now, I don't know how many Sunday school teachers talk like that today. But that's the way they thought. Conversion was the deal. So he said, I want to get to the point where I can get this young kid to say, okay, I believe, I accept, I'm going to, I'm going to follow Jesus. So he found out where Moody was working during the week, and he walked on by and he had an attack of conscience, an attack of the guilt. He said, is it right for me to do this? And he walked on by the shoe shop, shoe shop and he said, I, I, I don't know if I'm up to this. I don't, I don't know if I can. He prayed about it, and he said, you know what, I'm going to do it. Walks into the shoe shop. Now, Dwight Moody was such a good salesman that if you were walking by the shoe shop, he would grab you and say, i got such a deal for you. Come here, let me show you. I want you to see these shoes that I got. And he was out selling everybody. His goal was to make $100,000. He wanted to make money. He was... He was on his way. He was doing a great job. And his Sunday school teacher shocked him by showing up at the shop, not to buy shoes, but to talk with him about his faith. He says, let's go back in the break room. Let's go back to the stock room. Or what, this, what, what, what year is this, or what roughly? This would be 1860 at the latest, okay. 1840 or to 60, somewhere. In the Good point. I, I need to find out. because. If, if I, if someone's got their phone, look up the, the great Chicago fire and, and take back about five years from now. So they get, in the, they get in the back room and he said, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And he wants you to be his own. Will you accept him? And Dwight got down on his knees and he said, yeah, I'll do that. He wants to choose. <laughs> just like that. Yeah. It's, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, I'm sure, but that's the way the story is told. So Dwight changes from being an avaricious guy that's willing to walk over any hot coals to make money to now being a convert. So what's he going to do with himself? He joins the YMCA, and he starts working for them. 
And he starts doing to these street urchins what was done for him. He says, you want to ride a pony? Come on in, i got a pony that you can ride. And he did. I'll give you some candy if you'll come oh in gosh. here and hear. <laughs> and so he applies his sales tactics and he starts, of all things, a Sunday school. And it's doing well. Now, keep in mind, this is a time when child labor is okay. So this is Chicago. This is, this is where a lot of us Midwesterners are from. And he builds a church based on all of these people that are streaming into Chicago because of the second industrial revolution, which is post-war. So that makes it 1865 or thereabouts. So Chicago fire was 1871. Okay. That's when his church burned down. And the Y burned down, everything burned down. And Moody was now an accomplished revival speak, uh, uh, speaker, preacher. What was his theology? Well, a woman came up to him and said, I want you to know that I don't subscribe to your theology. And he said, oh really? Well, I'd be, I'd be pleased if you told me what it is, because I don't think I have a theology. You know, I'm, I've never adopted one. I just want to win souls for Christ. So when he got started, he was very much involved, in his mind's eye anyway, with the poverty that was all around him. And so he would get coal for people who didn't have enough to heat through the winter. And he would bring loaves of bread, and he would hand them out, and then he'd give them a sermon or give them a talk. And he said, I, I began to realize that when I had coal, they were thinking about, when's this coal going to run out? And if I gave them a loaf of bread, they were thinking about <laughs> eating the bread instead of what I was talking about. They were focused on the wrong thing, so he quit. He said, I have, I have no point in that. And as such, that's kind of a an epigram that's kind of a kind of a representative story for what the fundamentalists did but the fundamentalists following the moody example not just because he did it but because that's where their thinking went went completely opposite remember it's the fundamentalists it's these revivalists that start start the train rolling with abolition they're the ones that bring about the Sabbatarian movement for worshiping on Sunday, a big deal for a while. You know, they're the ones that are conscious about health care. They're the ones that are going into the slums at first. All of that's gone. Now they're interested in saving souls, and that's it. So Moody has an example. And his example is the Lord gave me to understand that it's a tumultuous sea and everything is, is going to rack and ruin. And the Lord gave me a lifeboat, he said. And he said, Moody, save all you can. That's your job. That's all that you need to focus on. That isn't all he focused on, but that's what he said. I'll give you another story that I think is typical of the way he preached. He told a story about a, a man who was a typical worker in Chicago and, um, you know, just dog tired, but he was trying to be a good father. So he went out with his son to walk in the park along the river, whatever, and sat down to watch his child play, fell asleep. Kid walked too close to the side, went over and died woke up and he said, where's my kid? He discovered that he was good. He said, that's what your life is like. He said, you wake up and you find it's gone. You wake up, you find your treasure is gone. You wake up, he said, stop now. Don't let that happen. He said that he had preached on the night of the great Chicago fire when everything was going down. He quit the sermon early. He went home and moved his, uh, moved his family north to get to get out of the flames, he said, 
I forgot. I didn't tell him to repent that time. He said, I'll never preach that way again. Every time I preach from now on, I'm going to make sure that they hear the call. So he did. And he was fabulously successful. So sometimes God works in mysterious ways. We know what happened is while his church is rebuilding, keep in mind he started with none of this. He built up a big church called the Moody Church. And he had a successful effort underway. And it was gone in one night. But he got an invitation to go to Europe and preach there, run a revival there. So he and his band leader, his soloist that I want to tell you about in a little bit, Iris Sankey, they went to Europe. And they said, well, we'll see what we can do. It was Ireland. And, you know, so there's issues there, too, going on. They got there and they waited for their cab to come, as it were, for their horses, horse-grown carriage to take them where they go. Nobody showed up. Turns out the guys that financed their trip both died. Oh, God. So they're there and they got nothing. They have sort of a mission in mind. They said, you know what, let's just go preach anyway. Let's see if we can drum up an audience. And they start and the next thing you know, they're preaching Uh, I gotta go back. They're preaching. I wanted to show you the picture. You've seen it before, I think. Anyway, they're preaching to uh, the Royal Opera Hall, and um, the people in um, the high society of England are in the opera seats. And he's talking to everybody, and he's got a, a fabulous following. So here's his theology in so far as he was able to, to cobble it together. Three R's. Ruined by sin, redeemed by Christ, and regenerated. That's the fundamentalist favorite word. Regenerated by the Holy Spirit. In other words, when God takes over and calls you by the gospel and sanctifies you, that's synonym for regeneration. New life. You've started over. God is inside you, God is working you, and that's all he really needed to do. But he not only kept it simple, but he brought in Ira Sankey. Now, Ira Sankey is a fascinating guy. Ira Sankey is um, a baritone, apparently, soloist. And Moody was walking around or somehow wound his way up into one of Ira Sankey's concerts. And Ira had a good following already, making, making a decent living at it, I guess. And he walked up to Ira Sankey afterwards and he said, you have one person making a difference? He said, you have to sing for Christ from now on. You've got to come and join me. And he was so good, and his voice was so great, and his ability to write songs, at least the music part of it, you know, in the Rodgers and Hammerstein, uh, Hammerstein, whichever of, uh, of the day, he was the Rodgers. He was the songwriter. But he was so good that people just came to hear him sing. Then they had to put up with listening to a sermon besides. <laughs> but, you know, they got a free concert when they came to hear Moody. They got Ira Sankey, and he was apparently really, really good. How many here know the the old, the, well, um, the 90 and 9? You know that hymn? That was probably his his best one. I'll see if I can play it for you. I don't know if we'll get, get time. I've almost got time to get there. So Moody was a great recruiter. Not only could he go directly to people and engage them like that, but he went to the captains of industry. Remember now, this is Chicago. There's a couple of really big companies in Chicago that are started up. Probably the most famous one of the time is done by a guy by the name of Cyrus McCormick. What did McCormick invent? 
The Reaper. The Reaper. Made gazillions of money. Just about as good, you know, quintupling the production of the average farmer that would have to cut down the, you know, with a scythe or whatever, and now he can drive over it and pick it up. Moody would go knock on his door and say, you've got to help out. It's time for you to pony up some money. We need to build a church or we need to open up this Sunday school. And the farmer said, let me write a check. He had, he had a way with fundraising that was unbelievable. But he also had a way of reclaiming souls that is not well known. Probably the most famous Bible in American history. Maybe, maybe including the RSV in the early 1950s. It comes out in 1909. It's the Schofield Bible. And it's done by fundamentalists based on what Cyrus Schofield said. I understand the Bible better than anybody that came before, and I'll explain it all to you chapter and verse. So he built what was called a reference Bible. This was the world's first study Bible. We buy study Bibles today. They have concordance, everybody's used to that by now, but they also have notes on the same page. What Schofield's genius did is it made it possible for Schofield to get people to read his words about what the Bible meant side by side, and people couldn't tell the difference sometimes. They, they kind of conflate them. So it became to the point that Schofield is like the Lord himself in terms of giving vent to what comes to be known as premillennial dispensationism. That's the primary religious organization for all of the non-denominational churches in America today. It's popular here and nowhere else. Only in America is premillennial uh, pre dispensationalism pop. And I'll spend a, probably a whole, whole time with you. So Moody picked up Schofield in the process. His following figure, and Schofield is not exactly a guy that you'd want marrying your daughter to start with. It turns out he was a politician, got caught with his fingers in the jar, spent a little time in the Huskow, maybe an alcoholic, not really sure about that, ran away from his family, and Moody made him basically his own chaplain for the school that he was opening up at home and had another one just like it in Chicago. And then his followers put up the money to give Schofield the time to write the Schofield Bible. So under his branch, under his wings, this is the part that I wanted to get to, to, to hold on to for what's going to come is we talked about the holiness uh, movement under um, the Methodists. Somehow, and I still haven't quite figured it out, somehow this business about regeneration that, uh, that uh, Moody was so fond of became kind of a little wing under his leadership. And the way they did it, uh, I don't have it on this one. I have it on the next one. The way they did it is they had conferences. Now, there's a big change that comes in 1869 after the Civil War. It's begun, interestingly enough, in 1863, and it's completed in 1869. What am I talking about? West and East connected by oh, Transcontinental Railroad. Transcontinental Railroad. In the meantime, the East Coast is bustling with the building of railroads all over the place. So it's possible now for all the leaders to get together for a weekend and compare notes and to harmonize their thoughts and to have debates and sort things out. And it started in England over um, holiness but it became an issue, not an issue, it became a practice that Moody and his followers built up for fundamentalism. 
So I'm going to tell you there are probably two, but in this case I'll even go so far as to say there's three major trends that are going to set up what becomes the big controversy that we have. Okay. Number one is this gathering of believers, true believers in this, in this line of logic. And for the dispensationalists, they get together in Niagara on the Lake in the U.S., not in England where they did about the, uh, the um, holiness movement. So they followed the model that they had and they built up this idea of dispensationalism. Okay, 13 seconds on dispensationalism, so I won't leave you totally hanging for when they come. This is what our brothers and sisters in Christ believe if they're in non-denominational settings. I'll say nine times out of ten just to, just to keep it safe. Okay. Number one, since the beginning of recorded time in, in biblical epochs, you have great dividing lines in the Bible. They're called dispensations. During a dispensation, God reveals himself to people in a certain way. The dispensation comes to a crashing end. Something goes wrong. In the first end, in the first dispensation, Adam and Eve sin. They're banned from the garden. Okay, let's see that. Second dispensation, according to Darby, is Tower of Babel. The final dispensation is the one that we're in, they say. That's the sixth. The sixth dispensation is kind of a and aside, because what's already happened is everything that matters for the Jews. That's already happened. It's already done. Now, great big vertical line, because the seventh dispensation is about to start, and it's going to start with Jesus bringing his church away. That's called rapture. You've probably heard about raptures. The idea of rapture is, if you're a saint, in quotes, what Paul calls a saint, which means really a believer, if you're a believer, you get saved now. You don't go through anything that's coming, but what's coming is awful. And this is what they all believe. The end is, is going to be wretched. And it's going to go on for how long? Three days. Yeah, depending. Three and a half years to less and another three and a half, so seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all total, right. And the difference between the old dispensationalism and the Jenkins and LaHaye left behind series is <laughs> Jenkins and LaHaye say those that are left behind that didn't get caught up get a second chance. Darby said, nah, yeah. it's wow. over. But what's left is, Scripture says in Revelation 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. So 144,000 Jews. No more non-Jews, no more Gentiles. Gentiles are done, you missed it. Well, Jenkins and LaHaye couldn't have made money <laughs> under, under that. Under that. They, they have a wonderful series. It's fun to read. It's, it's not Shakespeare. But it's, it's, it's fun to read you know, about what happens to those that realize their mistake and that come to faith during this horrible time. It's, it's, it's a fun read. So then at the end of time, they say, comes the Battle of Armageddon, and then comes Jesus. So Jesus comes not once, not twice, but three times. The rapture is secret because no one sees him that's not in the church. That's why it's called secret. You get to see him in the air. If you read, and we will, the passages that they cite, that may not sound exactly like the way that you grew up, but that's going to be a big deal under Moody's banner. Now, I'm gonna tell you, and I'm, I didn't do right by John, because this is where the next part comes. So on the one hand, you have this, this moody cadre, this clash. On the second hand, you have academe and science challenging, and you have a big reaction. And then on the third hand, you have two guys in what state? Take a guess. 
again. Yay! <laughs> these, these guys, these brothers, make money in oil in California. They are, um, gosh, I, I'm trying to think of the brand now. I'm, I don't want to say standard. Yeah. Or, or. It's it's either Chevron or Gulf. Or it's, it's one like that. I mean, it's a gargantuan. They, these guys are filthy rich, and they're Christians, but they're fundamentalists. Is that the Union Oil? Sorry. Is that Union Oil? You said Unical before. Unical. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah they, they might were, be the '76. Might be. I think. It is the same. It's Unical. That's Unical. Anyway, Union '76. They decide Unical. to plow this money back into serving the Lord. So one of them sends money to, to China for missionaries, and the other decides to to do missionary work in the states. And he publishes a, a series of books, 13 volumes, about. These are the doctrines that matter to Christians, and they get to be called the fundamentals. And about a third of them, if I remember right, are dispensationalists along this line that I just mentioned. And the other two thirds are things that you could probably find some, some comfort in. You know, these are the top authors of the day, and they send them free everywhere. Every pastor in the United States gets a copy. Every Sunday school teacher gets a copy. Every camp counselor in the U.S. that they can find gets a copy. And they send something like 100,000 copies to Petra in, in the ancient Near East to be stored in the rocks because Darby told them that's where the Christians are all going to come to at the, or the Jews will come to at the end for Armageddon. they got to learn if they're going to be saved they got to read it somewhere, so why not when they're all fighting off in the in the final battle of the world? Wild stuff. So think about that stuff. We'll kick it around some more in two weeks. <laughs>